Welcome to the Everyday PM Podcast, a podcast where we discuss project management principles for your everyday life. My name is Ann Campia, and I am a certified project slash program manager with a ton of years of experience working for healthcare, retail, consumer goods, tech, marketing. I've been kind of all across the industries here in the PM world. I am so excited to welcome David Rose, who is an entrepreneur, MIT lecturer, author, and expert on digital innovate, product innovation. He is also going to introduce us to some of the more recent books that he has written. But David, before I do your intro any more injustice, please take a brief moment to introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Hi, Anne. Um, so I am a uh, product leader and have developed a number of uh, products that are being used by many, many people. Um, I uh, My career started off when I was uh, at the Media Lab uh, at MIT. I uh, worked on the Lego Mindstorms project, which was a robotics invention kit that uh, hopefully has, has taught a lot of people how to kind of be inspired to build uh, things with Legos that they that they imagine, but then also to put behaviors into those into those things so that they can build robots that have uh, that can animate and respond to sound and lights. Uh, I worked on Guitar Hero early also in my career, uh, which tried to kind of democratize making music and jamming with other people. Um, I know a lot of people use that. Um, I, I started a company called Ambient Devices that created little wireless objects that make you aware of information throughout the day. So the ambient orb, I have actually an ambient orb here. It lights up to show you things like what the stock market's doing or what the weather's doing or what when the next bus is coming or how many steps you've walked or other kind of glanceable information. And uh, I wrote a book called Enchanted Objects, all about IoT. And recently, I've been really interested in augmented reality, like that is how to kind of create a metaverse out of the real world uh, and superimpose information that could be useful uh, throughout people's day. And, and one of those things that we can talk about is boating, because I'm, I'm kind of taking the world of self-driving technology and applying it to the marine environment. Great. Awesome. I, you know, when there was an outreach from your team on whether or not you would be a great fit for the Everyday PM, the Everyday Project Manager, uh, I saw your bio and I thought, holy crap, there are a thousand things that are a great fit for this podcast. I mean, we could have gone every which way with this interview in terms of talking about product innovation, talk, talking about AR. I, I, I just want to start off by in really introducing yourself to the audience in terms of your professional journey, because it's so fascinating how people get to where they are in their space today. And I looked at your bio, VP of Warby Parker at one point. I mean, there's just a lot of steps and milestones that I learned about you that I'm so fascinated to share then with our audience. So take us through the professional journey and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Well, I think I've always been kind of open to finding new opportunities for innovation. Uh, many of them have been kind of made possible with new technologies. So when I, I graduated from undergrad, I, I grew up in the Midwest and did a physics major and a fine arts major because I was kind of equally interested in science <laughs> and, and design. That's incredible. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was thinking about what to do as a career, you know, obviously architecture came to mind. But when I went and did a lot of informational interviews at architecture firms, uh, I found a lot of people pretty frustrated because they said, you know, this this is such an established field that as a new architect, you really end up doing a lot of things that aren't very creative for the first 10 years of your of your career because there's so many people that are architects and into architecture and trained as architects that it's it's not really um, a greenfield opportunity. So instead I got very excited about museum exhibit design, which oftentimes if you're you know working for a science museum or even a history museum trying to do a simulation like you are FDR are you going to jump into world war ii uh and and uh, you know respond to churchill that was one of the simulations that we created um you know you kind of get to learn a lot quickly about either scanning electron microscopy for the for the uh for the for the boston museum of science which was one of our first projects that i did as a uh 
I created a, a, my first company to do museum exhibit design. And that was one of our first projects was, you know, helping to explain this very technical thing to a very broad audience. And so we got to use kind of the tools that were available at the time, which were touch screens and expensive computers and animation and multimedia. Um, and then the web emerged and like that offered another set of potential and, uh, uh, technologies and I created one of the first uh, photo sharing websites kind of this was um, before it was a good idea because uh, it was hard <laughs> to your, your, your digital photos online um, but I would say kind of with with every with every um, chapter of new technologies and the democratization of you know what we could do with embedding sensors into everyday objects or creating new musical instruments or creating IOT you know, connected, connected objects. Um, and now with glasses that can embed information in terms of, you know, kind of AirPods in mm -hmm. the temples of the glasses, like what Bose is doing, um, or even project information into, you know, blending what you see in the real world with information. Though that's another advance, advance in technology that, you know, as a designer, gives us kind of a new field to explore and design. I, I love it. I, there's your, To your point, there seems to be some connectivity between all of the choices that you've made in your professional journey with innovation and creativity and the evolution of just the things that are available to us. And, and that was the first connection point that I made to our project management uh, community is that even in project management, as kind of boring as our profession sounds sometimes, is that with innovation comes new ways of being a PM as well. And, mm -hmm. and how you're saying, you know, each product kind of came uh, as a, an idea from something that happened before it, you know, in PM, there's always this evolution of the way we do things. And very, very often, and actually in 2023 in particular, as we talk about the trends that are happening in our industry, a lot of what's going to evolve, at least what's projected, is that it's going to progress with AI and, and this introduction of, of automation and, and the tools that PMs can use to mimic the repetitive behavior and what we do so that we can start to get creative and innovative and, mm -hmm. and other areas that we often don't have time to even think about or look at. So I love that there's this synergy between kind of the way that you've portrayed your professional journey and with everything that you've created. I'm just in awe of that. And I think that there is something to say about um, the way that can show project managers how we can also evolve with the tools that are available. And, and when there are not tools available, you were still able to create some amazing things. So thank you, David, yeah, that was, it was great. It was rarely, I mean, to your point about um, project management, like it's rarely me, it's merely only me. Like if we mm. take this product, which um, uh, this is an internet connected medication cap that goes on ordinary pill vials. Um, so if somebody has a heart transplant or a liver transplant and they really need to take like the immunosuppressant so they don't reject the new kidney or heart or uh, liver, it's, there are some medications that are incredibly important to, you know, they're prescribed but not taken very um, regularly. And so we kind of, we understood that this was an issue. I put together a team of people that uh, included people that were industrial designers that could, you know, kind of craft beautiful um, uh, forms, uh, mechanical engineers that could figure out kind of how it could attach, um, electrical engineers that could figure out how to create, you know, how to make a watch battery that you could insert in this last for nine months and make sounds. This makes a kind of arpeggios when it's time to take your med that kind of tap you on the shoulder acoustically. Um, so cool. It also blinks like a bike light to, to kind of try to get your attention without being too obnoxious. Um, and uh, we had to work with AT&T, the telco, in order to connect it to the internet. So this just jumps to a nightlight, which is really a, a, a cellular modem you know, the guts of a cell phone that you plug into the wall, just like you plug a nightlight in. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of the combination of people that knew specific things about their craft and then being led by somebody who had a vision of how do we make, you know, medication adherence something that is, um, 
that is easier and and something that people will welcome into their lives you know that will be given away for free at the pharmacy um the business model was look pharma companies you're going to sell a lot more meds because people are going to be taking them more regularly so yeah. there's a big lift in in the potential for pharma companies win medical insurance companies win because you don't go to the off you, you don't have unnecessary hospitalizations people are healthier because they're taking the medications that they're prescribed. Um, and, you know, so it was kind of, it was a vision, it was design, it was packaging design, it was mm -hmm. mechanical engineering, like kind of assembling all those people. Um, that's been the story for anything that I've built uh, over, over time is kind of how do you know enough technically about the process that each of these disciplines needs to go through um, in order to uh, coordinate the kind of vision and make sure that everyone is has a fire under their butt in order to, <laughs> in order to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, very often we got to be the ones lighting it. Yes, absolutely. And and for those that are listening or watching, that was such a wonderful use case for you. I would recommend if you're listening to this episode, go back to the beginning of what David just said, because he starts with we identified a gap or we identified a problem or some sort of use case that would be beneficial if we could solve for our end users. And in this case, it's people who are in medic medication. And I, I have worked in the product development space and been able to see the brainstorming storming sessions, the engineering of products, and then ultimately seeing that in the end user's hands. But some of the project managers may be in different industries where you don't necessarily get to be in the upfront part. Maybe you're just kind of in the back end working on the logistics of everything. So David, can you walk us through uh, how that brainstorming works? How do you come up with the use cases? Because you have so many that you've shared already with us that are so fascinating that they were able to go to market. So can you talk to us a little bit about how that works and, and how do you work with the team on that? Sure. I think oftentimes when a new project, the genesis of a new project is um, may come from something that you don't know a lot about. You have a kind of a hunch, right? Mm -hmm. You have, you think, huh, like for example, with the, the boating project that I'm currently working on, I have this hunch that maps of the Appalachian Trail and of the woods, like are just these kind of beautiful, beautiful representations that pack a lot of information in and help you understand kind of the grade of something or the risk of falling or how difficult it will be. And these topo maps, thanks to other companies like ArcGIS, which has this uh, GIS's graphical information systems, they are now available more and more because of satellite data. Um, so I thought, well, could we take these kind of maps of the mountains and project them with augmented reality into and through the water to give you a sense of being able to see through a water surface? You know, it's kind of this magical inspiration of like, could I have x-ray vision, you know, in this situation? You know, I've, the augmented reality world has, has um, been, uh, kind of doing projects that have to do with seeing into a machine for for being able to um, see what needs to be fixed, like into an aircraft engine or through the streets of a city to see infrastructure. So I got really excited about this idea of, could you just hold up your phone and see through the water surface anywhere in the world to see kind of data elevation models and where to fish and where not to boat um, uh, to really on the ground. So it was kind of, it was first kind of inspiration. And I didn't know if it was a very good idea. So I immediately, <laughs> I immediately sketched, um, uh, and I'd be happy to show you, or maybe send you afterwards, so you can cut it in. Sure. Like I, uh, I worked with a graphic designer and we kind of sketched a bunch of situations where it would be useful to see underwater topography superimposed in a harbor or in a lake or that kind of thing. And we didn't write any code at all. We just, we sketched stuff, we showed it to people, and then we started this kind of customer research project and, and went out on boats and interviewed boaters and said, 
what are the marine electronics that you use today and how and do you ever run aground and do you ever like how do you find fish and how do you um keep track of where other boats are so you don't run in other boats and what about the fog and what about um twilight when you're coming home and it's dark out like how do you how do you navigate so we kind of unearth a lot of of needs and tried to kind of map those to what the existing tools that boaters had were and what the price of all of those were to kind of just prove to ourselves like is there an is is there a business here is there kind of a cool right. idea that's new and novel um and then we wrote a patent for anchoring 3D topo maps over bodies of water. And then we hired a team and developed an app that would do it. And then after being out on a lot of boats with an app, like bumping up and down in the waves <laughs> um, and trying it with AR glasses, um, you know, trying to put the information like into your field of view and realizing, well, it doesn't really work very well because these aren't waterproof. These are <laughs> waterproof yet, and they, yeah. you know, the, like the the projection technology is not bright enough yet. Um, we eventually decided, well, actually, to solve this, we really need to make a camera system that goes high up on the boat. This is called the lookout camera. So this is the current the current what oh, it wow. currently looks like. So this this sits way up high on the boat and has a three hundred and sixty degree camera system, like a lot of cars have these these days. Um, that sees out with stereo vision in mm -hmm. front of you and can try to find small craft or things that are in the water or people. Um, and then it takes that information and, and has a video feed that just shows it on the screen, which is right at the helm. Um, and so now that's, that's, incredible. The, that's the system we're building. And it turns out it's like hardware plus a game engine. We're using Unity as a game engine. Um, and wow. it's computer vision. And so from a cop from a project management perspective, it's kind of a it's a lot right, right now. <laughs> yes. Because it's, you know, it's um a relationship with a contract manufacturer in Norway who's going to build the product. It's a engineering team that's based in Cincinnati. It's a software development team um, that does a game engine. Uh he's based in London. Uh it's an it's a interaction design firm and a graphic design firm and a branding firm that's based in Florida. So it's like, can, wow. like working with a boating company that's based uh, uh, down in Florida. So it's, it's a lot of moving parts. I think for me, one of the kind of ahas for the, for this project that's called Clearwater is create these kind of moments that things must be delivered because mm -hmm. We're gonna go to Khan. We're gonna fly everybody to Khan, and we're gonna show this to boating companies. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of gotta work, <laughs> you know. So yeah, I'm always trying to kind of create a deadline moment that can also be a summit kind of experience. Um, that's somewhere between you know three weeks and seven weeks out, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that everyone feels like, oh well. Let's figure out what we can achieve in that sprint of time, sure. and and we can all come together and work together and solve problems and get out on the water together um, in order to, you know, to kind of take the project to the next level, which will we won't be done, but it will like, like it will be the the next important milestone that everyone's really working and cramming for. Sure, sure. So setting realistic deadlines as best as you can, being. Being realistic I don't think those about are necessarily realistic. <laughs> it's more Aggressive. just like it's just it's setting these kind of intermediate intermediate um, uh, intermediate deadlines, like intermediate yeah. kind of sprint sprint points. Yeah. Yeah, because I can imagine with a project this big, and then there's just so many moving pieces, and you don't know what's going to work and what's not. That that helps settle the team in in a way that you know, there's, there's smaller, more consumable bites of the project that they can work towards. I think a lot of what comes with being a project manager is there's a finite, there's a defined end to a project. And that most, most people that go into project management, that's where they find their satisfaction is when they actually finish something, accomplish something and have that feeling of, Hey, I made this, or I had contributed to this project. And 
for you to set those intermediary steps is, is probably very helpful for the team to feel like they're progressing towards the bigger picture. So uh, I think one of the things that I'm trying to think about transitioning into, because I want to ask you about another innovation of yours, is when dealing with the boating project right now, I'm sure communication across all of the multitude of teams that you're working with mm -hmm. is key, making sure that people are communicating and understanding where everything is at. Now, there's an invention that I saw that you created, which is the conversational balance table. Uh, and I don't know how long ago that was done, but it, you created it for Salesforce to increase team communication and collaboration. Mm. I'm fascinated by that just because a lot of what we do as project managers is shepherding communication. We are harboring the communication between the teams, breaking down the silos and that sort of thing. So when it comes to this particular thing that you have created, the conversational balance table, how how did that come about? How did it work out? Do you find that it was effective? Did, did it give you the results that you were looking for? Would mm. love to learn more about that. Yeah, I. Um, so the inspiration really for this came from a book by Susan Cain called Quiet. And it makes the point that in organizations and in teams, you have extroverts and introverts, and usually they have just as many good ideas as each other. Um, the introverts have plenty of good ideas, but the extroverts tend to kind of um, dominate and like not let out those good ideas that the introverts have. And through, you know, through my work with um, ambient devices, um, you know, the orb is like a feedback device. You know, it gives you, it helps you see like, have I walked as many steps as I want to walk? And that it's expressed through a color. And the, the information is really like glanceable. And so the feedback loops are fast. So you don't have to have, you don't have to go to an app at the end of the day and say, how many steps did I walk? But instead, like you kind of want feedback loops to, um, to motivate a change in behavior in the moment, you know, or rather than having to do a big retro at the end of the week, you'd rather have teams provide feedback to each other in kind of subtle ways. I think as we're like, if you're a facilitator in a meeting, you kind of want to do things that subtly um, encourage people who aren't contributing to kind of, you know, say something. And so if you're yeah. a facilitator, you might like use your hands and gesture and say, you know, what about you? Or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or ask, or ask somebody who's speaking too much, like you might even kind of put your hand on their shoulder, maybe or something, try to yes. push, push them down. So the inspiration came from how could we embed feed a feedback mechanism into furniture that people are already sitting at? So this was a six sided table, like a table for six people that had six kind of facets around it. Mm -hmm. And, um, it lights up this kind of beautiful, almost like a star constellation underneath the veneer of the table as people speak in front of them. So you can at any point, you know, minutes into the conversation, you kind of just look down at the table surface and it shows you graphically like the contribution of each person um, over the last 20 minutes. Wow. And the, the behavior is very slow. So it's kind of not shocking anyone, but it's also evidence. So you can see like this, this, this person has been dominating. This person hasn't said much at all. And hopefully people kind of glance down and kind of subconsciously see this and can moderate and regulate their own behavior. Um, and maybe it's appropriate for certain types of meetings for certain people mm -hmm. to say a lot and for certain people, but at least you have like kind of a little bit of evidence of what's happening. And, um, and so it can be clear, like that feedback mechanism can be clearer. Um, and so we, I worked with an architecture firm, one of the biggest in the world called Gensler. Uh, they were designing the new Salesforce offices and they were kind of interested in how could you make more sensing and kind of passive feedback mechanisms um, that were embedded in the space itself. Uh, another thing we did was a a brainstorming table that would listen to the conversation and put up images, almost like a wow. continuous Google image search, just as like a, uh, as to kind of get people to think more non-linearly kind of out of the box. But the balance table was really about this, you know, giving people just feedback on, contrib on kind of contribution percentage. And right now I can tell like I'm talking way too much. <laughs> no, no, this is that. 
I, I, I may, my mouth is probably open because I'm just so fascinated by that. I, I always, I often think of how great would it be to introduce more innovative ideas to things as mundane as a weekly status call. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 what you're describing is just something that would completely break the mold of what we're used to. And I, mm -hmm. I'm just so in awe of, of that and where that came from. And I'm, I'm, I would be interested to see if I used it in my own space, if what would come out of it, but you're right. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I think we usually leave meetings thinking, oh, well, there was only one person contributing or why was it, why was that a meeting that could have been an email type of conversation? So mm -hmm. it's, it's those things that come to mind on our day to day that can often lead to something as really cool and innovative as what you've described. And hopefully the folks that actually got to test it out or are, are cur currently using it are, are finding it beneficial, but I would imagine it would it would it, it, there's like a sociology or psychology to it as well in terms of how people interact and and them understanding if they're if they are extroverts introverts or or, or whatnot in a meeting space so that's that's right. really cool david now yeah, if, you, people, if people want to see a video of it um there's a there's a website that goes with my book um that's called uh, supersite.world um and it has videos of the conversational balance table and the voting application and some uh, a, a, a project that's about redesigning with algorithms landscapes um, outside people's homes to have more shade trees, more natural pollinators, uh, less grass to to uh, poison with with your chemicals. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's another that's another project called Home Outside that's um, I'm really proud of. That's that's also at that same that same uh, URL supersite.world. That's great. I'm. I will definitely make sure we include all the links and images or whatever you're willing to share with the audience. And you perfectly segued into what I was going to ask you, which was you've got all these uh, innovations out in the world, and now you've been working on. Um, it sounds like you're publishing yet another book. Uh, but tell us about all the all the literature that you put out into the world as well. Um, well, I've only done two books. Uh, the The first one was called Enchanted Objects. Um, it's kind of all about the Internet of Things. Um, there's an umbrella that knows when it's going to rain uh, that's on the cover and kind of the, the hilt of the umbrella makes this kind of uh, rain pattern uh, oh, cool. that reminds you to, to bring it. And this is really all about kind of what are the human desires that are age old desires that are revealed in fairy tales and uh, myths and how those, those desires uh, for omniscience or uh, telepathy or uh, other kind of wishes can be satisfied through internet connected things that keep us healthier or whatever the use That's case amazing. is. That's amazing, wow. And the most, the most recent book is called Super Sight and it's really about as a, as a species, like what should we be seeing? You know, like what is the thing that we really are myopic about today that would really be useful to see? And the argument that I make here is that um, we have a hard time seeing the future. Like we have a heart, like we kind of live in the moment and and it's hard for people to kind of imagine a more sustainable landscape or a more walkable city or a more, mm, um, mm -hmm. or environments that, you know, aren't as dominated by cars or, or by uh, chain stores or whatever. So one of the things that augmented reality can do is to, show us kind of a different vision of what the world could be around us that would inspire that change. That's great, amazing. I, I'm looking forward to picking up both of those books, actually. I just feel super inspired by what you've shared with us today. And uh, and there is for sure synergy across what you've put out there in the world and what project managers or product managers are currently working on. So I'm sure they will also feel inspired by everything that you've shared. So David, I have one more question for you. Maybe it's a challenging one, or maybe you know this right away, but of all the innovation you put out there, which one is your favorite? Well, I mean, the kind of the, the heuristic for favorite is, I think something that really responds to human needs and human desires that has like an elegance or simplicity to it where people see it and they're like, of course, like what, <laughs> this, didn't, this didn't already exist. Um, uh, and that also kind of folds in the, the creative work of not 
only one discipline, but you know, kind of people that are skilled at information that design and wireless and um, data and design. So I guess I don't know. For for me, it, um, you know, I am fascinated by camera systems and computer vision and all of the things that the world can see around you. Um, the one that I would, I think I'm going to mention is there's a, it's a new company. It's called Xander. They just won a C, a, a, an award at CES. And basically it's captions for the world. So imagine you're talking to somebody and they speak a different language. Uh, it translates the language and then puts, and then shows you the, the text of what they're saying as if you're, as if you have oh, captions. Wow. Um, and neat. those are, those are superimposed over the other person. So o like o over their body. Uh-huh. Um, and it's especially good for people who have a hearing deficit and because even hearing aids like kind of suck in loud environments. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has a beam forming microphone array and and can listen to the person, you know, in a very narrow way of who you're talking to and then be able to project captions on people as you as you glance at them in conversation. So with there are a lot wow. of people, a, a lot of aging people in my life. My my mom and my my mother and father in law. They're all wearing hearing aids. The hearing aids all suck, and yeah. I really want to like I really want to help people because it's important for their own for their own, you know, to avoid dementia, to mm -hmm. stay engaged in conversations. Like you want them to be more social and more social with you know in spaces that are not mm -hmm. just one on one kind of uh, interactions. And so the ability to have a technology that helps them continue to engage is something that I'm really proud of and, and want to see a part of the world. Gosh, that's just incredible. And I, 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 I might, where my mind went was just beyond kind of the using it for, you know, my mother is, is you could use that to break down communication barriers that exist in, in the workplace right now, especially as we see a lot more people losing that in-person touch because many mm. companies have gone to remote work. I see that that could potentially help in the communication channels that are often lost because we are communicating just by text or by email more frequently than we are via in-person or, or virtual. So there could be something there as well. And so I could easily see that breaking down some of those barriers too. So that's great. Thank you so much, David, for sharing that. So, I mean, I think we've taken up enough of your time today, but I think we've learned so much about you and what you've put out, the amazing things that you put out into the world. So David, if folks want to follow you, continue the conversation with you, where can they find you online? Yeah, supersite.world uh, has a lot of design principles for augmented reality. Um, I definitely encourage you can download the, the first, first and last chapter of the book for free. Um, uh, I'm at David Rose on Twitter, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, people can reach out to me. My MIT uh, email is dlr at mit.edu. So they can also reach me that way. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll make sure all the appropriate links are below this uh, posting as well. Just a quick plug to support the Everyday PM podcast by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcasting platform you are listening in on. The podcast is available on Spotify, Google Play, Overcast, you name it. Just search for the Everyday PM. You can also find the video version of this conversation with David on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Ancampia. While you're there, leave us a comment. Let us know what you thought. Ask David all the amazing questions. Maybe inspire us or inspire David with more of your incredible thinking and ideas and innovation. Um, and then leave any questions that you may have for either of us on there. Um, that will do it for you, David and I. You should have used more Snapchat filters, Anne. I, I mean, been on video. I like I've got a bunch of Snap uh, filters that like work in Zoom. You know, David, I'm surprised you haven't invented something that we could have used today in the Zoom <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but I'm sure it's coming from you. I would expect nothing less. So, David, thank you so much for joining us on this installment of the Everyday PM podcast. And until next time, take care. <laughs>